All right, Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his uh, speech for the 76th Independence Day set an ambitious target of making India a developed nation by 2047. He also made a renewed pitch for cutting import dependence and boosting domestic manufacturing. But what makes India a developing country and what steps can be taken to turn it into a developed country in the coming decade. Now, this is a very important statement made by the Prime Minister. And of course, the 15th August speeches are generally occasions where large visions are put into place. Uh, this is going to be no easy feat. Just to give you some context, in 1947, we started off as a third world nation. We are now a developed nation, a developing nation. Now, the definition of a developed nation changes from agency to agency. There's no one clear definition, but broadly speaking, the per capita income needs to be high. The country's economic growth rate needs to be high. And the standard of living that a large number of citizens enjoy is one of the big indicators. To speak more on this vision and where we stand, what are the challenges in reaching this goal? I'm uh, pleased to be joined now by Rajiv Kumar, former Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog. Thank you, sir, for speaking with us on the India Development Debate and good to be talking to you after a long time. Can you hear me, sir? All right. We'll just try and get uh, that connection back with Mr. Rajiv Kumar. But just to give you a sense of what it means to be a developed nation, um, the distribution of income is also a very important parameter that would separate a developing nation from a developed nation. And this is perhaps one of the big challenges that India will be facing. And just to give you some data away of how the World Bank looks at it, the World Bank currently categorizes India as a lower middle income economy meant for countries with a gross national income per capita of between $1,086 and $4,255 per year. So just for comparison, a high income country like the U.S. has a PCI or a per capita income of about $13,000 or more. I hope I have Mr. Kumar back. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All Hi, right. Tamanna. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, sir. Great to have you on the show and great to be speaking to you uh, after such a long time on an important issue, I think. Um, it's no mean feat to aim for India to be a developed nation. Let me begin by getting your take on what would define us as a developed nation. What would define a developed nation versus where we stand now? What needs to change? Uh, Tamanna, the standard definition of a developed economy is uh, that you qualify to become a member of the OECD. And there, the membership used to be granted when you had a per capita income of $22,000. And the current uh, level of the OECD economy as a group per capita income is about $45,000 or so. So if you think of becoming a developed economy and joining uh, the OECD, the minimum that you should reach is $22,000 per capita. Uh, and if you want to be a peer, you would have to have a per capita income of $45,000. But most often, all of this is now defined in PPP terms the purchasing power parity terms. And that would mean that at our current per capita income of about $7,000 in PPP terms, you would have to go up to, uh, let's say, about $25,000 in PPP terms uh, if we want to designate ourselves as a developed economy. So that's the standard definition. But I would just want to add here that this summary definition of a developed economy is perhaps not the best measure because it must include also how this income is distributed over the different income classes, plus also in our case, our regions and our states because of our diversity. So we can't have uh, you know, uh, one part of our country growing much faster than the others. So there are some other nuances that we have to add uh, to this definition of the developed economy. Um, like I mentioned in my opening, there is 
no one standard definition, but what most agencies and most economists, I'm sure, agree on is the quality of life and the fact of whether a large enough part of the population has access to key basic necessities, their health, education, transport, opportunities of livelihood, um, etc. Do you think that's where we need to really drill down and look at where we stand? Before we come to that, Tamana, let me sort of uh, give you the first quantitative bit, which is that we are at, as I said, $7,000 per capita in PPP terms today. And our average growth rate over the last 25 years, uh, since the, you know, our reforms took place, has been about 6 6.5%. So if we continue to grow at that same rate over the next 25 years, we will reach about $35,000 in PPP terms by 2047. So even if we maintain uh, the average growth rate that we've achieved over the last 25 years, we will be in that quantitative definitional terms a developed economy. Now you're very right in saying that, oh, yes, this is a summary figure, but that doesn't guarantee that the general, you know, the life of the people, the you know, public welfare, etc., are guaranteed for the largest majority of our people. And so, to that extent, I think uh, what we need to ensure is the quality and the delivery of our public services, and I, of our meritorious public services, in which I include uh, law and order, basic health, primary education or secondary education, and our environment are taken care of. In, the, in all parts of our country, and that we don't have a huge marked regional inequality or inequity in our country. Now, this is where I think we need to give, our, give, give the most attention uh, to ensuring uh, that uh, we have, everybody has access to good quality education and good quality health services. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big uh, challenge, but we are doing rather well because of uh, what we've done recently. Our national education policy is now is, is catered to that. Our Ayushman Bharat and the, and the, and the, and the health uh, policy is beginning to achieve that. And of course, uh, with the development of our infrastructure uh, the, and the Gati Shakti, we will ensure that all our regions are well connected and connected both physically and digitally. So I think to that extent, if we do achieve that rate of growth and continue our focus on providing basic pub public services to the, those at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the way we are beginning to do, I think we will achieve our goal of being a developed economy in multiple ways, in multidimensional terms, rather than just a pure quantitative GDP and GDP per capita income terms back to what you said that even if we keep growing at the same rate of an average of six six and a half percent we'll get there in uh, PPP terms now there are different estimates and some of them say we need to grow at at least 12 percent per year to get to developed um, nation status by 2047 how do you look at that criteria the high growth rate criteria and should we look at it as relatively to everyone else? We're expected to grow at about 7% this year. Um, it's not the best that India has achieved, but it's better than everyone else. Should we look at it relatively, or do we need to grow faster because we have to play catch up? Well, we certainly have to grow faster than the rest of the world, especially the developed economies, because you know, they have a huge base. So even if their growth rate is 2 or 3%, they add a lot more wealth to themselves than, you know, than we add when we're growing at 6, 7 or 8 percent. But, you know, going for 12 percent, etc., I'm not sure where these numbers are coming from, but the fact is that between 2003 and 2007, those five years, we did manage to achieve 8.5 percent. So that's doable. That's doable for us, even our conditions, and given whatever, you know, ground realities that we have, including our democracy, our diversity, our regional differences, you know, our, our human resources, our savings rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, here I think so that's something that we can aim for. Now, let's, let's, let's remember that uh, China has shown that a nine and a half percent rate of growth 
over four decades between 1978 to 2018 is possible. And, after, and once having reached $10,000, $12,000 per capita, uh, they would slow down. But then that, as I said, means that you're growing at a very high base. So 8 9.5% is em eminently doable. And if we do 8.5%, we will, I think, get up to uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, something like uh, 45, 47, some $45,000, $50,000 by 2047. Now, which would mean, by the way, if we are $50,000 or so, uh, that a population about 1.6 billion, that will be an $80 trillion economy, which will be perhaps challenging the U.S. to be the second largest economy in the world. So, one, it is doable. Two, we we'll need to try very hard to achieve and sustain this rate. And three, that we have the unique challenge of having this growth and yet remaining green and, take, and, 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 and ensuring that our environment is taken care of. Now, no other country in the world in human history has had to face this twin challenge of growing rapidly and yet also uh, you know, protecting your environment. So India will have to be uh, will, will have to uh, charter his own path and, and, and take up the challenge uh, for you know, growing while remaining green. I'm, I'm convinced that if we try hard enough, we have the talent, we have the resources, and we have the intellect uh, to do this. Uh, but most important part of this is that we have to build a coalition amongst all our stakeholders, which is based on trust and the trust that all of us are working for the same common cause, which is our national you know, development and which is the, you know, the betterment of the, the great, great majority of our people. Now, that trust-based coalition across all stakeholders in the economy or in the society is one of the preconditions for achieving this relatively high rate of growth of, let's say, 8.5%. 6 and a half, we have been able to do what, with whatever we have. But for notching up the two extra percentage points, we'll not only have to try harder, but we'll have to think out of the box and also take all possible help and records to the new technologies that are emerging, which also will, will be a challenge because they sometimes pose a trade-off uh, between technological technology absorption and job generation. So there are challenges, but as I said, uh, I, I am convinced that if uh, we could win our national independence against all odds, we can achieve this also uh, with all the challenges that we have uh, facing us. The question is, I was asking you is that who needs to take the lead in this journey? And the backdrop of this is the freebies versus subsidies kind of debate that we are seeing. Is the government to continue being the provider of good quality education, health care, or does the private sector need to step in? Are you asking me that question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, you know, um, this debate about freebies and subsidies, etc., I think is uh, losing uh, its, uh, its, uh, its substance. You know, because in every democracy, transfer payments are necessary. In every market-based economy, market-based democracy, and democ transfer payments are essential. And in more... And, Probably every country in the world, uh, what you have is the government responsibility to providing equal opportunities in terms of access to good quality education and good quality health, principally because these, once you achieve, once you, once you provide that, they have huge externalities, positive externalities, because you, know, you provide them and therefore they, they have a, a beneficial impact on the rest of the economy and on the growth. So these, are, these should not be... These should not be uh, you know, dismissed as freebies, etc. What you what you need to curtail is uh, is handouts which only improve the in life of the individual and and encourages uh, wasteful consumption. Now that has to be curbed, and and that is, and that should be curbed uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but but the, but but there has to be a clear distinction. Now somebody can say, and there are people in the U.S. who would argue that that even the law and order can be privately provided. Why does the government need to step in? But that's not, that's an, that's not an argument. And you can't include that as a freebie. So I think the debate about freebies 
and about genuine merit 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 transfer payments has to be done uh, more uh, more thoughtfully uh, and i'm sure uh, people will recognize uh, that uh, that a uh, that is that a society committed to providing a better living uh, better welfare higher welfare for its people would have elements of public services which are provided by the public authorities efficiently and with the proper accountability and transparency i talked about uh, this question with reference to healthcare and education and these are two parameters which would improve the standard of living of people and maybe be a more valuable definition of what a developed nation should look like right now these are very very dominated in the private space especially if you want any kind of quality is that an important thing to change while we're on this journey i am convinced that it's an important thing to change because for me uh, the best the, the the for me the uh, important part the, the critical part is to provide equality of opportunity to all our citizens and if you have differential access to quality education then the equality of opportunity disappears right away so therefore i think it is important that uh, that we have uh, the universal access to the best quality primary and secondary education for all our children and especially in this in this day and age when they will need to equip themselves more and more uh, to 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 face up uh, to the technologies and the, the which are coming up the same thing goes for primary health i think it is it is it is it should be a part of the social charter between the government and the citizens that every citizen would have access to good quality health basic health now i'm not saying that you know, anybody should pay for you know uh, for for uh, for for beauty surgery or, or you know etc but basic health uh, must be available so that there are there should be no instances where ill health causes a person to descend below the poverty line and 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 causes the trauma for the family so yes so those two uh, and they by the way both those have a very high uh, level of positive externality productivity levels improve in the society as these are made available and again i repeat myself in an age of technological turbulence you know this is the, the both these are essential uh, you know um, uh, services to be provided by the government you know just one uh, more comment on education because while we are managing to educate more and more people their employability post education remains a big question mark and this feeds into the employment issue as well so there is a lack of good quality well paying jobs uh, and there is a lack of enough people to fill even those positions how do we get out of this conundrum well the national education policy uh, is aimed at getting us out of this conundrum uh, because it has this four year you know flexible course where you can improve your skills in the first or two years then go back and then join the employment stream and then come back to improve your improving your uh, qualifications uh, so that you continue you, you, it's a form of a continued education that you do that you get uh, again it is the part of it the skill uh, vocational part of it uh, and and the skill enhancement part of it also takes care also addresses that to that to a major extent plus i think uh, and i've been an advocate of it for a very for a strong advocate for it is that we have to strengthen our apprenticeship system uh, so that what we can get is people studying uh, or, uh, and at the same time being in jobs uh, so and and this is there is a, there is a, one of the most successful experiments of that is being tried i think by uh, by savan dr uh, vivan savan uh, around pune where he has 125% placement of children coming from the poorest backgrounds who do who do a job uh, in uh, five days a week and then over the weekends uh, follow a curriculum of studies to keep improving the you know, to, to keep improving uh, their 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 qualification i had proposed when niniti that our national open university should adopt this and encourage this across all states because that combination of working on the factory 
uh, on the factory floor plus studying at the same time uh, take, make, make, ensures that you are up with what is required and at the same time also continuously improving your skills uh, while, while being employed. Um, I want to add another point on equitable growth and India is a nation of contrast in that sense. You get data on how luxury cars are selling in higher numbers than before, but uh, two-wheeler sales sometimes are staggering. Um, the rich during the pandemic did get richer and the poor did get poorer. How do we bridge that gap while not lapsing back into a socialist kind of an economy? The last part of your question, I think, is critical. We do not want to lapse back into a socialist pattern or a social or a license control license economy, and we do not want uh, to put curbs on people's ability to earn uh, earn revenues and earn incomes and and generate wealth. Because I think only by generating incomes and wealth are we going to create uh, are we going to go, going towards becoming a developed economy. At the same time, equity is very important. And that is where I think the Scandinavian countries have shown that if we are able to, uh, if we are able to deliver public services, quality public services, most efficiently, and, and make public services uh, a larger part of the consumption basket of the ordinary people, then the equity by itself, you know, the, the, the level of equity rises itself. And the, and, and the Gini coefficients come down because everybody is getting access to the same quality of education, the same quality of health, and, and, and basic housing. So now it doesn't matter if some people have $500 billion, $500 million homes uh, and, 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 and the others, uh, you know, but, but, by, but the others get what, what under the Pradhan Mantri Awaz Yojana is a reasonable house in which they can you know, find shelter uh, from the seasons. I think that's good enough. So it's not important to pull down those who are above, who are at the top, but it is critical to raise those at the bottom to a level which is acceptable to us as a society, as a society which, is, which considers itself to be fair and which considers it to be, you know, to, to, to be just and which provides to all its people, again I repeat myself, an equality of opportunity to exploit their talents to their very, to the highest potential society that is fair, that is just, along with, of course, the per capita income needed for a decent life. That's what we aim for, and hopefully we don't have to wait till 2047 to realize that dream. Thank you so much, Rajiv Kumar, for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me, Ravana. All the best. Thank you.